prayer, as I mentioned this concept of cherry picking in the church, I got to talk to you in the context of prayer. And the reason that prayer comes up, I was thinking the past few weeks I've said in prayer, and we just have a couple of people show, and I know that people got all kinds of things going on, and I'm reminded that the one thing that the enemy wants to stop above all else is prayer. If he can stop your prayer life, there will be no power. No prayer, no power. Much prayer, much power. And the way he stops you in terms of prayer is he has you think that when you pray, you are bipolar. <laughs> you are talking to yourself. You are schizophrenic. Mm. The psychiatrists tell you, don't they, Sister Jean, that you have imaginary friends. <laughs> <laughs> and they have you doing all these things to keep you from understanding that you are seeking to do what? Have communion with God. Because prayer is about communication with God. Prayer is about fellowship with God. And so if prayer wasn't important, there wouldn't be such an emphasis put on prayer. Now prayer must be important since Jesus himself prayed. Jesus found time to get away to pray. Jesus, who was a part of the Godhead, and even though he stood as man with the Holy Spirit on him, he still knew that he needed to pray. And at different times I've taught on prayer, I've talked about types of prayer and kinds of prayer, but I've come to the conclusion through prayer that none of that really makes any difference. It's kind of academic unless there is a real zeroing in on what happens in the prayer relationship with God. Some 30 years ago, Time Magazine did a, a, a series on the front page. It had a picture of a person who had all of these electrons wired to him. And this person was engaged in the act of praying. And scientists were trying to understand why when people pray and they have them booked up to these electrons, that there are surges of power they go through the machine and change the readings, but they can't find any logical explanation for why the readings are changed. Because prayer has power and prayer brings power. Prayer is the key to everything that you are confronted with and dealing with. And the more important it becomes, the more the enemy will have you push back. If you don't think it's important, try to sit aside some time for prayer and see what happens. <laughs> Say you're going to pray at 5 o'clock in the morning and see what happens. Somebody across country is going to call you. <laughs> Some stranger is going to knock at your door that's got the wrong house. Something's going to go wrong. Fire trucks going to go by, sirens. Something's going to happen to interfere with your focusing on prayer. Say you want to get up in the morning and pray. You know, this is a real problem back east because back east what often happens in the morning is Unlike here, in the morning, it's really cold. Mm. It is cold, cold. I'm talking about blow small frost kind of cold while you're in bed. And you're talking about getting up to pray, and that voice is saying, stay here under these blankets. It's so warm. You can pray later. Don't bother. And it takes some effort. Back east, it takes some effort to get up and go to church when you got to dig the snow to the sidewalk. Mm. But we're talking about the importance of prayer. So I want to I wanted to say something about some types of prayer because when I look at Psalms 37 in the Bible, Psalms 37, which David wrote, kind of gives you some insight. When you want to pray, you want to have a relationship with God. When you want to pray, you want to be able to talk to God. But we have discovered from studying the Word that if you're not saved, God can't hear your prayers. Mm -hmm. If you're not saved, your prayers can't go anywhere. If you are saved and you are married and you and your spouse not talking, your prayers can't go anywhere. Mm. So that's why the Satan likes to come and keep confusion in the house. Because if he can keep you not talking, then you ain't going to be praying. And we know how that works, right? People go to bed, you turn on your side, they turn on their side. You got an imaginary board down the center. 
Okay? Right. And, and then nobody said no prayer before they went to sleep. Nobody said, now Lord, lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. It's like my soul, your soul. Well, I don't care what happened to him as long as we keep this board here right now. Distraction. Distraction. Pulling you away from prayer. And so we got to overcome this. And so the first thing that has to happen if you're going to have a prayer life, which is the key to having a relationship with God, you got to have a prayer life first. Really? Yes. Romans 10, 9. Romans 10, 9 gives us the foundation. What does 10, 9 say? It says that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's the first step right there. So what do we do? We come to church and say, Father, I, Jesus, I confess my sins. I invite you into my life. And we know this says we're going to be saved. A lot of us think that it stops right there, don't we? Mm -hmm. So we say, well, I can really do what I want to do now because I'm saved, and so the rest <laughs> of it doesn't matter. Not so. <laughs> Verse 10. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Well, how is confession made unto salvation? Well, it's not just enough to confess your sins. In addition to confessing your sins, there has to be a repentance factor that goes with that. And the repentance factor is what hooks up with the confession that opens the door for you to get through to God. If you look at Psalms 51, if you follow me, you're gonna, it's going to take you somewhere with this. Psalms 51. David has this prayer that we all have seen when he got busted. And we go to verse 3 of Psalms 51. David says, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. David didn't try to excuse his sins. He didn't try to hide from his sins. He didn't try to say, Well, God, you know how it is. I was on the balcony, and I just happened to look over there, and it was more than I could bear. So, I mean, you just, you know, it's just one of them things. You know, you know how that works, right? So, you telling God that? Oh, well, maybe David could have tried that, but he didn't. But you can't even use that one there because you have what? Um, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Now, there is no uh, temptation given to you that is not common to man for every temptation that God gives you, He provides a way out of the temptation. So if God provides a way out of every temptation, temptation cannot become our excuse, right? So when we go back over to Psalms 51, verse 4, this is the key, what David says in verse 4, after he acknowledges his transgressions. In verse 4 he says, Against thee, thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight that you might be justified when you speak and be clear when you judge. David was really serious about God because David be praying these prayers like, hey, you know what, if I ain't right, strike me down. We don't pray like that. We, we know that oh, we're going to pray so far, Lord, but we're going to stop. We ain't going to take it too far. Okay. And, and uh, I like to use Psalm 7 as an example of how we do selective prayer, okay? I'm going to read it as part of it to you because I want you to get this in Psalm 7. This is a prayer for deliverance. He say, O oh Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me. Let least he tear my soul like a lion, rending it in pieces. Verse 3, O oh Lord my God, if I have done this, if there be iniquity in my hands, mm, get the boldness of this. If I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, yea, I have delivered him that without cause is my enemy. Let the enemy persecute my soul and take it. We don't take no chances. We don't pray like that. We say, Lord, if I've done something wrong, forgive me, but let's not take this too far. <laughs> okay. let's, let's not carry this all the way out to the ultimate. Here. Okay, because I mean, you know, forgiveness is the key. We're sorry about it, but, but we don't want to die over it, okay? David's attitude was, if I've messed up, then take me, okay? That's a man who has a sincere heart. 
in terms of his relationship with God. And that's why God said that David was a man after his own heart because David was serious in terms of putting his sin out there. Folks, today we have gotten very comfortable with the concept of being politically correct. But we don't want to deal in truth and we don't want to deal in righteousness. All around us people are dealing in excuses for truth and righteousness. And they're calling it correctness. I've been listening to the news the past few days as they talk about Hillary and her emails. Yeah. And, I, and I listened to uh, what happened this week when uh, the Republican senators sent the letters to the Iranians, which has never happened in the history of this country, where some uh, uh, one body of Congress yeah. would seek to undermine the president with a foreign government. Yeah. Unheard of. Right. Right. This kind of foolishness that's taking place. But And then I look at the at the Congress, I look at the Secret Service scandal last week, and I look at the Secret Service that was an elite force responsible for taking care of the president. Now, because we got a black president, the Secret Service has become a circus sideshow. Right. I, I think they ought to take a lesson from uh, scandal, get rid of them, and put Navy SEALs in there to protect the president. Yeah. Yeah. Bring in the Green Beret, somebody who ain't gonna play no games and gonna be straight up, because it's become a joke. It takes me back to when, uh, remember the story, the spook who sat by the door? And, and they let him in, and, and he wasn't supposed to be anything but just seen, and he took it seriously. Well, it's got to be a joke in terms of how we are functioning as a nation, and we have time for everything except truth and righteousness. We're not interested in it anymore. No. The shooting that took place in Ferguson. No. You know? I thought it was very interesting that the sheriff got on, the county sheriff got on and said, in effect, well, we really expected this to happen before now. We don't know what took so long. Now, I have a theory that there wasn't nobody black that shot those two cops, that the person who shot them was white, and that they shot them because the whole idea was that if we shoot them, they're going to go off and they're going to kill the rest of them out there in the crowd. It backfired. Yeah. Just like I know and believe that that black man did not shoot that Latino an Asian officer in New York. Yeah. That was a hit that was yeah. set up by the New York police. Yeah. Because if he was going to get revenge for Eric Gardner and Michael Brown, why is he going to kill two ethnic officers? Wouldn't he go out there and shoot two white people? That's right. Yes. Yeah. And then he going to turn around and shoot himself? Wouldn't he try to take more with him? Right. If he was going to really be an assassin? Yes. So we live in an era where everything we get is tainted and twisted and is designed to get you all worked up and concerned over it. But all you need to know is that there is a God in heaven who knows right from wrong, that Jesus is on the throne, that he's coming soon, Amen. and that you ain't going to have to be worried about this on a long-term basis. Amen. And all you need to know is that he's going to take care of you in the midst of whatever goes on. Mm -hmm. You ain't got to worry. It can start hell and fire just like it did in Egypt. I bet you won't fall on you if your stuff right. Mm -hmm. But if it's hitting you, then it's something wrong. Mm. If it's hitting you, it's something wrong. And what does this mean? This is back to this whole idea of prayer. Because if you are praying to God from the standpoint that I'm a good person <laughs> and not a righteous person, then your prayers ain't going nowhere. You're in trouble if you're praying to be a good person. And I thought it was very interesting, the scripture that we had this morning from Matthew 6, I believe it was. It just didn't go a little bit further. In Matthew 6, 5, Jesus is teaching on prayer. And 6.6, 6, oh, he's 6.5. I want to read what he says because this is so important to us. And when you pray, you shall not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Truly I say unto you, they have their reward. Hmm. Now, we're not a big enough church, but there are a lot of churches out here, especially some of the more traditional churches, where they call upon people to pray, and if a certain person gets up to pray, you just well sit down, <laughs> close your Bible, take a nap, and set the time on your watch for a long. To wake you up when they finish. Because they're gonna go around the world, they're gonna go everywhere, and they ain't going and it ain't going no place. And then when they finish it, they they Jesus talks about vain repetition. I grew up in the South when they used to be praying. You could tell when they were getting ready to finish it. It would stop. And when we have done all that we've been assigned to do, and we've been all through everything, 
and you're going to come and welcome us. Oh, that ain't necessary. First of all, some of you going before you do what you've been assigned to do. <laughs> so what about when we've done all that we've been? Who are you talking to? Everybody going to be here that long. What Jesus says, but when you pray, enter into your closet, and when you have shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and the Father which sees in secret shall reward you openly. Your prayer is a means of communicating with Him, and you can't communicate unless you have confession and repentance, and repentance is godly sorrow for the sin that you confess. Not, I'm sorry that I got caught. I'm sorry that I didn't get away with it, but I'm truly sorry because I understand that this sin is not consistent with how you want me to live. Now I'm talking, and I'm, I'm going someplace with this because when you add all this up, it's going to lead to a result that we're going to really see that's quite clear. But he says in verse 8, he says, But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Hmm. Vain repetition. I'm not picking on a faith, but you know, I have some friends who are really good Catholics, and it kind of hurts my heart when I hear them doing the rosary, because they don't understand, they don't understand that Mary ain't got nothing to do with God's grace at this point. Hail Mary, full of grace, blessed are thou among women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb. The only time there's a Hail Mary done is when the angel comes to us to tell us you're pregnant. Ain't no more Hail Marys after that, except in football when they're trying to throw a <laughs> I think that's what they call it. I don't know about football, but I think it's a Hail Mary when you just hope something happens, right? They just stood it out there. That's the only other Hail Mary I know of. So Mary ain't got nothing to do with whatever your prayer petition is before the Father. This is not about Mary. Mary's assignment ended when Jesus hung there and said to John, Behold your mother, your, a woman behold your son, son behold your mother. He turned over to John, and that's where her mission ended, right there. And I told him in Sunday school, I'm telling you, be very careful tonight if you start watching that program, finding Jesus, okay? Because Jesus ain't lost. <laughs> okay. The ones looking at the program are the ones lost. I'm going to find a Jesus. He ain't lost. He ain't never been lost. And they got this thing all hooked up tonight. They're going to show you how he was probably a twin and ran away and <laughs> married Mary Magdalene and... They had a little baby, and the baby is the one you see, and not the Christ child. And all this is to dilute your faith. Because if the enemy can raise doubt in your mind to the divinity of Christ, the rest of it is over. Right? We covered that in the First Corinthians, didn't we? When we got into First Corinthians, we, we covered what happened. That if you don't believe in Jesus, then everything else is lost. There's no life after death. There's no resurrection of the dead. Those who we love that are gone, they perish. That's the end of it. Nothing works if you don't accept that there's Jesus. There's, there's no resurrection if you don't believe in Jesus. And if you don't believe that he's the Son of God, how can you believe that he rose from the dead? If you don't believe he's the Son of God, you can't believe in the virgin birth. You can't believe in any of it. And so this might sound strange, me saying this to you, because we're believers. But there are people out there that we know, that we try to talk to, they believe this stuff. And when you try to talk to them about the Lord, they don't want to hear it. Well, what about this and what about that? Well, you know what? I ain't sitting here to argue with you. I'm sales, not management. Confess, repent, get on your knees, and he'll answer all your questions. And if you don't want to do that, hey, sorry, we're going to miss you upstairs. Because <laughs> you won't be there. You will not be in the penthouse if you miss this call, you see? And Jesus is coming real soon. Time is winding down, folks, and we just don't believe it. We don't want to accept it, but that's the big trick of the enemy because if he can convince you that he ain't coming soon, everybody's going to keep on partying <laughs> right up until the last minute, you see? And what did the Bible tell us? When Noah and them were getting in the boat, the Word tells us that they were still having parties and being married right up to the time the door slammed. Once the door slammed, that was it. They didn't get it in until the rain started coming. So it's too late at that point. But we're trying to avoid being in that position. The reason that there's such difficulty in the, with prayer in the church is because believers don't think they've done anything wrong in their life or their lifestyle. There are people who come to church, look at you, 
don't speak, you didn't speak, it ain't my problem. They should have spoke to me first. There are two kinds of sin that's referenced. There's a sin of commission, which is doing something that God says you shouldn't do. And that's where Adam and Eve messed up. And then there's the sin of omission, which is not doing something that you should be doing. And people in the church are guilty of probably the sin of omission more than you are guilty of the sin of commission. Now, the reason I say that is because a lot of us in church feel that we have never, we haven't committed sin since the day we got saved. <laughs> Hey, I'm okay. I haven't done anything wrong. Um, that problem, that was their problem. That wasn't my problem. I didn't do it. I mean, I didn't say it. I, I just repeated what was told to me. And you are engaged in gossiping and backbiting and all this. Oh, but, but you missed that part in the Bible which says there's no room in heaven for all those kind of people. <laughs> See, I want you to look at 1 John 1.9. 1 John 1.9. Says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, I would rather confess to God, I think I did something wrong and I'm really sorry, than to come to God from the standpoint, I don't know what the problem is, God, because I didn't do anything. <laughs> this is probably what happens in marriages more than any place else. Well, problem, the problem is theirs, Lord. I mean, you know, I spoke to them. They didn't speak. You know, I, you know, I fixed their meal. I offered. I fixed their car. I said hello. I spoke before I left the house. You know, I don't know what the problem is. But how did you speak? How did you speak in the morning? Did you get up and say, good morning? Good morning. Huh? How did it, is, was that it, or was it, how are you? <laughs> I have to laugh, because I said this before, I said this when she was little. Sometimes Pastor Jerry would get bad with me, and I wake up in the morning, and I would deliberately say, Good morning, how are you this morning? How you doing? And she'd look at me like I wasn't even there. And then I'd go get my phone, and I would dial the house phone, and she, I know when she answered the phone, her personality sure. changed. When yeah. she answered the phone, she goes, hello. So I go to another room and dial on the house phone, and she pick up and say, hello. And I say, good morning. <laughs> and then I hear a buzz, a dial tone. <laughs> okay. Now, I say that in jest. I had a lot of.